Hey guys, welcome to the Command Valley podcast. I'm your host, Landon. Super happy to have you here. Before I get into today's episode, I'd like to just give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, which is GameGrid Lehigh. If you guys are in the Utah County area, you have to check this store out. They've got an amazing card archive, super huge selection on card and deck accessories, and an amazingly helpful and friendly staff. They're a great store and we've been going to them for years. Also, if you haven't had a chance yet, we'd love it if you would hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our future Deck Tech episodes that come out on Mondays or our future gameplay videos, which we will be releasing once a month. The topic for today's episode is going to be on the banning announcement that Wizards of the Coast released on the 19th of April, 2020. I think there was more information that came out on the 20th, which is the day I'm recording today, but the first big announcement was on the 19th. So they kind of released a lot of information and some pretty big announcements and we're just going to go over them just one at a time and just and I'm just going to give you my thoughts and opinions on these announcements. So the first announcement that they made actually goes back to the spoiler season for Ikoria. And that was when they introduced this new mechanic called Companion, which is a mechanic that allows you to have a creature as a quote unquote companion that exists outside of your deck and you can cast it and it can only be your companion if you've met a certain deck building criteria and you can cast it if it is your companion and you've met that criteria one time from outside of the game. And if you're playing standard, this card takes up one of your sideboard slots and in commander is just an extra card. Now, obviously, some of these criteria are a little bit more difficult to attain in a 100 card singleton deck than in a standard deck. Like for example, one of them requires you to play only even converted mana cost spells in your library or only play creatures or uh, spells that have an activated ability or only playing cards with a certain threshold of CMC into your library. That's a little bit difficult in commander, especially when you're trying to diversify your deck as much as possible in an effort to have enough responses for different types of things. Now, one of the problems, and this just goes to show you that cards that Wizards of the Coasts makes for standard aren't always created with Commander in mind, and that's okay. So the announcement that the Rules Committee made regarding a certain creature with Companion in regards to Commander is the first time they've ever banned a card the day it was spoiled. Now, the Rules Committee said that Wizards of the Coast did let them know that this card was going to be in Ikoria and that it probably would be problematic in Commander. So the Rules Committee already had some time to come up with a decision and a ruling before the card was spoiled. However, let's read the card. It's Lutri the Spell Chaser. It's a one hybrid, is it hybrid, is it elemental otter? That's a legendary creature. And its companion requirement is each non-land card in your starting deck has a different name. So for all intents and purposes, if you are playing red and blue, you can play Lutri as your companion with absolutely no opportunity cost to your deck. You're already playing non-land cards with different names because that's how Commanders functions. So really, if you're not playing Lutri, you're basically just missing out. It doesn't take up a card slot. It can be your 101st card. If you're not playing it, it's kind of the wrong decision. Even if this card had no abilities, and I haven't read them yet, it still is problematic. And I, and I agree that as a companion, it should be banned. And what does it do? It has flash. And when it enters a battlefield, if you cast it, you can copy target instant or sorcery spell that you control and choose new targets for the copy. So, like I said, if this was just a vanilla 3-2, had no abilities, this still is problematic that it can fit into every single deck that is playing red and blue. I definitely feel that that is problematic and that shouldn't be the case. However, this is where my personal bias comes in. I have been waiting a long time for an Is It Narumea? And if you're unfamiliar with Narumea, she is a legendary creature that costs two blue blue and she's a human wizard. And she basically has the same effect as Lutri. She has flash, cast her at instant speed, and when she enters a battlefield, you can copy target instant or sorcery you control and choose new targets for the copy. I love Narumea. I've built the deck several times. I've taken it apart several times as well, just because it gets pretty linear and it kind of does the same thing over and over again, but it's a really cool and unique deck and it's one of my pet decks. I also love Dual Caster Mage, and I love the Spell Slinger strategy, and I slam Dual Caster Mage in as many decks as I can because it's an awesome card. It can copy your spells, it can copy your opponent's spells. It's super flexible, and I've been waiting so long for a merge for this ability to exist in red and blue, and I finally get it, and it bites the bullet because of the companion mechanic. And my personal opinion, and I might get some flack for this, but I, I feel that Companion 
is not a very good mechanic for commander. I feel that since partner commanders already exist and a lot of those partner commander decks are a little bit problemsome in some metas and it kind of just homogenizes a lot of strategies because if you can play these two color commanders and add an extra color for basically no other reason other than you're playing these two commanders or you're just playing the backup commander for the color alone, you don't really care about that other partner's abilities. I don't know, I feel like that's kind of against some of the spirit of commander and i think that having a 101st card also kind of breaks the fact that you're only supposed to have 100 cards and commander is very 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 set on only having 100 cards and i also think that this mechanic is very confusing for new players to keep track of because you can only cast it once from that companion zone i'm going to call it i also think it introduces some awkward scenarios where your opponent might overlook something and their and their deck doesn't actually meet the requirements for companion i would have much preferred the rules committee come out and say companion is not a mechanic that works in commander and that they let us have lutri as a commander or in the 99 than banning it otherwise because they have said that lutri being banned as a companion also means that it can't be your commander or in the 99 and i that just kind of hurts me a little because i've been waiting so long for this specific commander and at the end of the day, I can always build it and play it with my playgroup. I've already talked with them. They're they're fine if I play it. But it's just kind of the principle that this poor otter is biting the bullet for a mechanic that I feel isn't super indicative of the commander spirit. I am excited, however, to see the spicy brews that people come up with with the other companion mechanics. I'm sure maybe I'll get around to building one at some point in time and at least all of these creatures with companion are legendary creatures and you can also build some pretty cool decks around them. So I guess at the end of the day, it's not the worst thing that could have happened and I can tolerate it, especially because my play group will allow me to brew a Lutri deck and play it. I don't know that I will, but it's just nice that that's just the nice thing about commander is you can kind of just set your own house rules for your play group because there aren't commander rules police that are going to break down your door and throw you in jail or take away your cards. Now, let's get on to the what is considered to be the very big announcement. The announcement that affects the CDH community as well as probably affecting some of the casual community. And that is the banning of the instant flash. Now, I'm just going to, so I don't mess anything up, I'm just going to read straight from their, the article that released. And, quote, Speaking of exceptional decisions, we are banning flash, the card, not the mechanic. Enough CDH players who we trust have convinced us that it is the only change they need for the environment they seek to cultivate. Though they represent a small fraction of the commander player base, we are willing to make this effort for them. It should not be taken as a signal that we are considering any kind of change in how we intend to manage the format. This is an extraordinary step and one we are unlikely to repeat. We use the ban list to guide players in how to approach the format and hope Flash's role on the list will be to signal cheating things into play quickly in non-interactive ways isn't interesting, don't do that. We believe Commander is still best as a social focused format and will not be making any changes to accommodate tournament play. Taking responsibility for you and your opponent's fun, including setting expectations with your group, is a fundamental part of the Commander philosophy. Organizers who want to move towards more untrusted games should consider adding additional rules or guidance to create the commander experience they want to offer. So what do I personally think about banning cards? I've probably made this statement or talked about this at some other time in one of our other podcast episodes, but just to reiterate, I, I generally think that it's kind of silly to have a ban list for commander, given that it's a casual format as as stated in the article that Wizards released alongside this banning. From my personal experience with Commander, I play with the same four to eight people every time. The, the other people in the podcast and a couple of other friends that I've made along the way. Our meta is clear and defined. I, I know what's strong for our meta and I know what's weak for our meta, for our playgroup. And I also know which cards to avoid and which cards would be way too oppressive to play and would detract from the social contract or the social experience. And I believe that this system is pretty optimal and I, and I hope that everybody can kind of get towards that place where they're not playing with a bunch of random strangers every week trying to, trying to guess what will work and what won't work in their deck. I think that being able to consistently know which decks you're going to be playing against really helps you build decks and have more fun. Now with this as context, I didn't, we didn't need a ban list for our group. 
I valued having a good time with my playgroup over winning. I was more interested in cultivating an environment of good interaction, good conversation, and good times with my friends. You know, kicking back with some pizza, some drinks, listening to music, talking about our weeks, talking about our plans for the future, playing some magic, almost as like a background type of that kind of like white noise, you know, when you leave Netflix on in the room and you just need it there to kind of fill that space. Sometimes Commander was that for me and a lot of times, and when I first started playing Commander, that's what it was to me. It was, it was almost an excuse just to hang out with my bros and have a good time. And that gradually, it gradually got a little bit more competitive as we got a little bit more into deck building and more into card theory and more into interactions and combos. And these steps eventually led me into playing CDH. And I wouldn't have gotten into CDH if I wouldn't have started playing on a casual level and developed that core love for the game. And I know that a lot of CDH players are getting a lot of flack right now because a lot of people, sometimes from the casual community, sometimes from other communities, tend to think of CDH players as toxic or tryhards or pub stompers. And while I'm not here to say that there aren't any people like that in the CDH community, but I'm here to say that as a player of CDH, that's not my mentality. I don't play CDH to go down to my local game store and just destroy everybody down there and make them feel bad about their decks and to make them feel like they're bad players to boost myself up. I play CDH because I love a lot of the interaction in there. I love playing super fast paced and having a lot to do on the first three turns. I like that almost opposite paradigm shift from the everybody only plays you know one spell and they're all setting up their boards for the first couple of turns and playing a little bit more battle cruiser as it is in casual i still enjoy that i enjoy casual commander just as much as i enjoy cdh it's two different schools of thought one of the things that is starkingly different in cdh is a lot of decisions aren't based off of emotions or based off of what happens in prior games or based off of any other artificial emotional feeling. A lot of plays that you make in CDH are strictly based off of, is this the best thing to do? And because of that, because everybody sits down at the table with that expectation, there aren't as many feel bads and there's not as much saltiness. So my perspective looking inside the CDH community and looking outwards is it's not as toxic as a lot of people think. And most people that go down to your local game store and they sit there and they're playing solitaire. You're sitting there watching them play a bunch of spells, taking 15 minute turns, countering every single thing that you do. That's not really what the spirit of CDH is. And you can agree or disagree with me, but that's my personal perspective on it. Now, that is a lot of context for one spell being banned, but it needs to be set up. And this just kind of shows you that the meta in CDH is a lot different than a casual meta. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of CDH takes place in turns one to four. And that's not to say that the game is over between one and four, but that is one of the premises of CDH is you are either trying to win or stop somebody else from winning on turn three or four. It's a very fast paced format. And what Flash enabled in CDH is turn zero wins or winning at instant speed during other people's turns in a very non-interactable or very difficult interactable fashion. Now if you're unfamiliar with Flash, I'll go ahead and read it for you. It's an instant spell that costs one and a blue and it reads, you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. If you do, sacrifice it unless you pay its mana cost reduced by up to two. So I think the spirit of this card was giving a creature in your hand flash that doesn't have flash because you put it into play, pay its mana cost reduced by two, which is the CMC of flash and boom, you got a creature at instant speed. However, the interesting thing about flash is if that creature were to have an enter the battlefield trigger or a death trigger, it would trigger because flash puts it into play, then asks for a mana payment. And if you don't make it, that creature dies. One of the difficult things about Flash is there is no time when priority is passed from when that creature comes into play to when you make that mana payment. So it's very difficult for your opponents to interact with that. Now, pro Flash is half of the combo, half of the problematic thing. The other half is Protean Hulk, which is a massive seven drop creature that's green that says when it dies, search your library for any number of creature cards with total converted mana cost six or less and put them onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. Now, believe it or not, there are a there are some cards that add up to six CMC that when they enter the when they are on the battlefield together does result in you winning the game at instant speed. And I'll kind of go over those cards in a second. But with now that you have the context of that combo, you can kind of see why it's very difficult to interact with and very powerful. 
If you if you aren't playing counter spells, it's going to be very difficult, nearly impossible to stop this combo. Now, I am a very amateur CDH player. I don't play a whole lot of CDH, but I very actively consume CDH content. I watch a lot of the CDH videos and a lot of the gameplays. I'm on a lot of the forums. I look at a lot of the deck lists. I don't know everything. I probably don't even know a lot, but what I do know, and you can talk to anybody else in the CDH community, the Flash Hulk combo was very potent even before this next card that I'm going to talk about was printed. So when Thassa's Oracle was printed in Theros Beyond Death, that's when the Protean Hulk, that's when the Flash Hulk combo became the de facto. This is the most compact, efficient combo in CDH. And if you aren't playing something this compact, your deck just isn't as strong. So let's read Thassa's Oracle. It has a lot of text, but when it enters the battlefield, you look at the top X cards of your library, where X is your devotion to blue. Put up to one of them on top of your library and the rest on bottom of your library in a random order. If X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game. Just casually, if your library is empty, if you only have zero cards or two cards left in your library, Thassa's Oracle is just going to win you the game. And so the Flash Hulk piles before the printing of Thassa's Oracle weren't quite as potent. They required a few more cards to pull off. You had to set it up a little bit more. You had to have maybe some type of a board state. They just weren't as compact. I personally don't play Flash Hulk and I haven't played Flash Hulk, but from what I've read and what I've seen, the printing of Thassa's Oracle cut several cards from the list. It replaced a lot of cards in the list and let the overall card quality of those Flash Hulk decks become a lot stronger. And furthermore, they changed the name to Fish Hulk. That's how strong this little Merfolk is in the Flash Hulk pile. Now, the other two cards that you get are Nomads on Core and Cephalid Illusionist. Basically, these cards are completely dead, and if you draw them, that's really bad. You are only hoping to see these cards when you flash Hulk into play, sacrifice it, and go and find them. Nomads on Core costs one mana, Cephalid Illusionist costs two mana, and Thassa's Oracle costs two mana. So add that up, that's five mana. You have one CMC left of creatures to get at your leisure, but essentially you need the Nomads on Core, Cephalid Illusionist, and Thassa's Oracle after your Protean Hulk has died from not paying the mana for flash. So basically what this means is your, your Protean Hulk dies, you put Cephalid Illusionist, Nomads on Core, Thassa's Oracle into play. Thassa's Oracle's trigger goes onto the stack. You hold priority, not letting Thassa's Oracle's trigger resolve quite yet. You activate Nomads on Core's zero mana activated ability, which says redirect one damage to any target creature. And you, there doesn't have to be any damage on the stack or being pointed at anything to legally activate this ability. You activate this ability infinite times, targeting the Cephalid Illusionist infinite times, or as many times as there are cards left in your library. Cephalid Illusionist says, when it becomes the target of a spell or ability, you mill cards from the top of your library. So what you do is, with the Thassa's Oracle trigger on the bottom of the stack, you activate Nomads on Court infinite times, mill your library, stop there, then let the Thassa's Oracle trigger resolve, resulting in you winning the game. Now the tricky thing with Thassa's Oracle is, as it is an enter the battlefield ability, unless you counter it, killing Thassa's Oracle doesn't do anything because the trigger's on the stack, it will go off, and you don't have to have any devotion to blue because if your devotion is zero and you have zero cards left in your library, that still results in you winning the game. And if one of your opponents goes to try and kill your Nomads on Core or Cephalid Illusionist and their kill spell or piece of interaction goes onto the stack, you can just keep activating the Nomads on Core ability on top of their interaction before it resolves, targeting the Cephalid Illusionist and you continue to mill yourself. And once your library is empty, you let your opponent's interaction resolve because at that point you don't really care because your deck is empty and then it results in you winning the game. So unless your opponents have A, a counter spell for Flash, a stifle ability to stop the Thassa's Oracle ability from triggering on the stack or some way to have some way of having you draw a card before the Thassa's Oracle ability triggers. There's really no way they can stop it. There's no way to interact. And with the right setup, you only need two mana, Flash, and Protean Hulk in your hand. There are ways of winning on turn one. There are ways of literally winning on turn zero with the Dream Hand. And although that's a super low percentage, but the fact that that's possible, that's pretty crazy. Now, I don't think that power level should always be an indicator of if a specific card needs to be banned or not. And generally, like I said earlier in the episode, I don't necessarily think that a ban list is super relevant because like I mentioned, I didn't need a ban list to tell me which cards would be good to play in my meta or not. I was totally fine not playing the upheaval spells 
that are banned currently that basically reset the game to zero. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to play against it. I don't want to play it. And there are also cards that aren't on the ban list that I don't want to play and I don't want to play against. However, as a viewer slash consumer slash player of CDH, I was getting kind of tired of seeing a bunch of Fish Hulk mirrors or playing against Fish Hulk. It was kind of homogenizing the meta and pushing more fringe decks out of the way because there was always that nagging thought at the back of your head that, well, this, this combo that I really like just really isn't as good as Fish Hulk and I have to put so many cards into my library that I normally wouldn't really want to play to stop the Fish Hulk deck. And I don't, I don't really like that. And I think that's a little bit unhealthy. And I do feel really bad for all the people that just built this deck and it got put on the chopping block. I hope that they didn't spend too much money on it. Fortunately, a lot of the really expensive pieces can be recycled and put into other decks and they'll still be potent, but it is very unfortunate. Another thing about the Fish Hulk deck is, and this is probably the last thing that I'll say about it, is in addition to running the most compact combo, it also could run the second most compact combo, which also involves Thassa's Oracle. So there is some intersection there to increase the consistency and decrease the negative card quality. And it ran Demonic Consultation and Tainted Pact, both of which serve a purpose of exiling your entire library to let you win the game with Thassa's Oracle. The fact that the Fish Hulk decks could simultaneously run the best, most compact strategies in the format was wild. And from a casual perspective, I think that banning Flash was the right decision. Wizard said in their article that cheating things into play that is very hard to interact with is against what they want, and Protean Hulk doesn't cheat things into play in an uninteractable way compared to Flash. Overall, I'd say that I am a six to seven out of 10 happy that Flash is gone. Like I said, I do feel bad and it is unfortunate for the people that just built this deck and, and potentially spent a lot of money on it. But I think that Fish Hulk being out of the meta opens up a lot of avenues for cheaper, maybe less compact strategies in CDH. And I hope that this is a way for new people to get into the format to play decks that they feel represent them better than Fish Hulk. It might be really easy for me to sit here and, and talk about how glad I am about it being gone as I play Consultation Kess, which arguably is probably at the top right now. There's probably some five color Consultation decks that are probably stronger, or maybe the Gitrog Monster, but it's a very strong deck, and it was one of the strongest decks before the banning, so I'm assuming it's going to be pretty well positioned coming out of this, but... I am overall really excited to see the shifts in the meta. We probably haven't seen anything like this in the CDH meta since the partner commanders were printed, Thassa's Oracle was printed, as the Fish Hulk deck would suggest, and I don't know, maybe the unbanning of Protean Hulk, but anyways, I'm kind of going over time, but those are just my thoughts and opinions. I'm not going to claim to be right or know everything. Let me know down in the comment section how you feel about it or if maybe you are interested in playing CDH or maybe if this is the first time you've ever heard of CDH. Let me know what you think. I appreciate it. And just one more quick reminder, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, just to do that so you don't miss our future podcast episodes, our future deck techs that come out every Monday and our gameplay videos, which we're super excited to bring to you guys. Thank you guys so much. We couldn't do this without you and I hope you have a great week.